All right, what do you think I think? Uh, first of all, uh, ladies' kitchen talk this Saturday isn't. Lauren's not here. So don't, uh, don't kitchen talk Saturday. I think she's planning then not the following Saturday, but the, is there a last Saturday? Maybe she's just tricking you. Anyway, it's not this Saturday, okay? Uh, mom and Dad's 60th, what's that? Is there? Okay. Uh, mom and Dad's anniversary, uh, I was going to say the 60th of the month, but it's not that. 60th anniversary, Saturday the 24th at our place. You guys are all welcome. This Sunday we'll have the maps in the, in the uh, program, so you guys are all welcome to come. 1 o'clock to 2.30, I'm cooking. Not really, but we'll have plenty of food, but I'm not cooking. Um, Ken, uh, I haven't talked to him, but uh, was being moved from the VA to uh, 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 Virginia. Where were you? What was the name? What's the name of that beautiful place? Anyway, it's behind Walmart, Manal and Carlisle. That's where Ken's going to be for a couple of months. I was uh, very happy. They've been taking great care of him, he said. Uh, pray for Ken. Uh, keep praying for Stan. Uh, Fred, a lot of you remember Fred. Fred uh, sat right over there, uh, uh, right on the end of the counter. Uh, Sunday morning, Fred passed away last night. Uh, used to run back and forth a lot to Colorado to visit with, uh, with his son and help his son. I guess his son was a contractor as well. Fred had been a contractor. And, uh, so uh, anyway, pray for his family. His daughter called uh, a little while ago to tell me that he had passed away last night. And uh, we'll probably, uh, uh, she, she wasn't sure what they had in mind, but uh, they'll be taking him back to Colorado, but wondered if we might have some, some sort of service or something at the funeral home. But we'll all keep you apprised of what's going on there, okay? Uh, and pray for rain. Keep praying for each other. Let's pray we'll get started, okay? You guys might want to start the timer, too, or I'll teach all night. I'll be here at 1 in the morning. Father, thank you uh, for this church. Thank you for everyone who's here. Thank you, God, for uh, taking uh, Lauren to California safely. Thank you for uh, that uneventful trip and for bringing her mom in from New Zealand. Thank you, God, that we're all here safely. God, pray that you'd get us home safely. But more than anything, we pray that you'd use us. Whether we're here, there, or in the air, God, we pray that whether through our lives or our death, God, we would glorify you and bring honor and glory to you. Thank you for everything you're doing. We're going to pray for Fred's family. Uh, God, you, you know our hearts, and you know when you're going to take us, and we pray that we would just be ready for you, and that uh, with, with every opportunity we have, Lord, we pray that we would uh, let the people that we care about, people that we love, know how precious you are to us and how much we want to make you happy. So, God, thank you again for this time. Thank you for the influence that, that you allow us to have in people's lives. Uh, for whatever time we get to spend together. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that we can ask you for rain. Thank you that we can thank you for everything we eat, everything we wear, and wherever we sleep at night, God. Thank you that this is a gift from you and that you know us and love us that much. Thank you in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Wow. Like magic, a message and a Bible. And All right. What do you think I think about partying? Huh? The foam part. What do you know about foam parties? Maybe we're talking about. I know. You've never been to. Would you like to go? I'll take you. Now, what what happened with the foam party? What happened? A fourteen-year-old girl died. Now, is is the party for fourteen-year-olds? It's at the state fairgrounds at the expo. She snuck in. It's for sixteen and up, and they have booze there. Can sixteen-year-olds drink? No. 21 year old so they sell booze but kids can't drink booze but kids are allowed but only the 16 but a 14 year old got in um, yeah the dad said probably because yeah. of uh, drugs um, so then having the foam party places doesn't enter into it, oh, yeah, it does. does it yeah. you think no a 14-year-old doesn't have any business at a phone party, but when you're 15, it's okay. 16? When you're, when is it okay? Oh, almost had you there. Almost had you. That close to having you, buddy. Were you? I thought you were going to say something. Huh? What's the difference between 14 and 16? What's the difference between 16 and 18? Mark. What's a phone party, brother? You ain't living. I'm not sure. But as I understand it, 
underage girls in bikinis get together with dirty old men with booze. And I'm not sure what they do, dance? I don't know. Who said yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that's a foam party, isn't it? Somebody straighten me out. What's a foam party? That's the point, right? It's just a, a dance. And they have a foam cannon. Just like anybody remember Lawrence Welk and the bubble machine? It's that, but a cannon. A phone party. That's a party line, viejito. Phone <laughs> A phone party. Hello, I'm on the other line. Sorry. Mom. Get up. Shh, my mom's on the phone. A phone party. So you, you think I'm against phone parties? What if there's no foam? Huh? I'm against any kind of party. I'm against any kind of fun. Why am I against something like that? I mean, is it in the Bible, thou shalt not attend a foam party? No. No. Huh? It's bad? Like what? Should I go? Everybody needs a chaplain. Maybe the foam party place needs a chaplain. There's a lot of bad things that go on there. Now, does it make any sense to you? I don't know. I'm a preacher, so I, I don't know. Does it make any sense to have underage girls in bikinis and old dudes with booze? Am I just kind of messed up? or Is it a bad combination? But 14, 16, what's it, 16 year old, 16 year old girls have enough sense to stay away from old men with booze, right? And I bet the old men with booze have the discretion to stay. I'm going to stay on this side because... So, in what world does that make sense? Remember Gary Johnson? I kind of like Gary Johnson because he was pretty, pretty, you know, except for his crazy stuff. But he was pretty crazy because Gary was a libertarian. I mean, Republican, but he was pretty much a libertarian. And, but, but he was pretty conservative and everything. But in his libertarian ways, he didn't see a I, I'm, I'm probably overstating, but as I recall, really didn't have a problem with basically any kind of business uh, regulating drugs. So long as they're regulated, there's tax revenue. It's safer for people because they're not getting, heaven only knows what was cooked up in some guy's trunk or, or back bedroom. At least it's way it's regulated and people are protected and the drugs out there are clean and the state can oversee it. Uh, prostitution, I don't remember his position on that, but as I recall, you know, as long as everything is regulated and safe and it's generating revenue, yeah. Um, there are some people who think that uh, legalized prostitution in Nevada or foam parties in New Mexico. Now, this is not a local enterprise, right? It's a, it's a national organization. There's just a, I don't know if this, these guys are, you know, a franchise. Um, okay, so you guys know that I probably think that's not a good idea, right? Now, if it's at somebody's house, then it's okay because you have a little more control over it? Why, am I, why do you think I'm against that? You think I just don't like fun? Okay, what if there's no booze there? You got old guys, no booze, and underage girls in bikinis. Then it's okay? Am I just hung up on the bikini part? No? What are those dirty old men? Maybe they live there. Maybe they're throwing the party. You want to keep them off the streets? Yeah. Huh? What is he? <laughs> Poor little girls. They don't have any place to party. Um, yeah, I'm not against having, uh, this, uh, I was joking with mom Sunday morning, right, with uh, their anniversary get-together, that because I love mom, just for her, I use the word party. We're going to have a party for mom. Why do I even have a hard time saying we're going to have a party? What, what is the connotation, do you think, in my mind? <laughs> not the ones I used to go to, <laughs> but in a lot of parties, I read, I read, so I know stuff. Hi, babe. I know nothing of what they're talking about. Uh, a lot of times at parties, what, what, again, not ones you've gone to because you're also spiritual, but a lot of times at parties, alcohol? Um, is that the worst? Huh? Irresponsibility? Yeah. Now, what if you drink responsibly? I see commercials. No such thing as drinking responsibly. I can handle my liquor. I can handle my, I know when to stop. Two or three, six packs, I'm good. 
just a glass of wine with my meal, just to take the edge off. That's under the influence. A buzz is drunk, isn't it? Yeah. Is it just me? Yeah. I mean, a, a dead brain cell is a dead brain cell, isn't it? <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not drink. You know, Baptist preachers get hung up on the passage where Jesus turned water into wine, yeah. right? Because it had to have been grape juice. It looks like it was probably wine. But I, I'm just going to keep preaching grape juice because wine is grape juice. Fermented? No way. Probably. Probably. And then for people to say to the master of the, of the, of the party, right, uh, you saved the best booze for last. Usually they wait for us to get drunk before they bring out the, you know, stuff they made in the bathtub. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous for you to go to parties if you're an old responsible guy or a young kid, you know, with still, you still got life in you. I think it's dangerous to go to parties. I think, I think I stayed out of a lot of trouble. I got into enough, but I stayed out of a lot of trouble growing up because I realized early on, if I'm going to get in trouble, I want to get in trouble because I make the decision, not because I'm around a bunch of people who make stupid decisions. And, and that kept me out of a lot of trouble. You know, fear and guilt goes a long way when you don't have any sins. It worked for me. Yeah. I don't want to get in trouble because the people around me are stupid. So, you know, I had a selective group of not smart people. <laughs> we were kind of the same. But, yeah. So I, I, I think there's a problem with parties. Um, what do you think I think about, um, I won't mention any church names, and you won't guess. But if basically you can get together with a few hundred other kids who say they love the Lord, and it feels like a rave. It feels like a party. Is, is that okay? At least you're around a bunch of kids who, who say they love the Lord, but the lights are the same and the foam is the same or the, everything else is the same. You don't have to know what I'm thinking. You don't have to guess a place. Why would I probably have a problem with a big old monster church that really reaches a lot of teenagers in the Lord and the music, if you can hear the lyrics, are, are right. Why is it so attractive? I mean, shouldn't I use my head and try to do the same thing? That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Eh, you just have a dirty mind. Probably they're not doing anything wrong. Probably it's all good. Why am I uncomfortable with it? What is it, what is it? what is it to swag? What is it in the old days to have a what? A swagger, a swag, uh, uh, an arrogance about you. Do we want our young people to learn how to swag? Do we want to slap it out of them? You know, I can't do that anymore. But, you know, we don't want our kids to learn to be arrogant. How, how can you be arrogant in the Lord? But we don't, we don't really think that stuff through. You know, swag for Jesus. It, it's, it, I, I think it's dangerous when we perpetuate worldly attitudes, even in the church. Um, there are a couple of churches close by that think even the music that we play is that, though. So maybe I'm just drawing my lines a little too... And, and I, I realize that. There, there's a real possibility that maybe I just draw my lines here, and it's okay to draw the line here as long as the sin line is way over there. I understand that, and I get that. But I think... We want to be careful, don't we? We want to be careful that, that we're not somehow uh, uh, encouraging the flesh. I mean, acknowledge we're still in our bodies. We, we still have this mind. We still live in this world. We still have preferences. We still like some things and don't like some things. And some things taste good and some things taste yucky. And some things make you happy and some things make you depressed. And, and some environments are just cool and some are, oh, when is this going to be over? You know, I, I understand all that. I just think we want to be careful that somehow we're not dishonoring the Lord in this thing that we're doing that's probably not so bad which is why I keep encouraging you. If you know you're doing something bad, we'll just Stop it. thank you very much. But I don't just want you to look at the bad things that you're having a hard time with. I want you to look at the good things. Maybe it's okay to stop doing some bad things. I mean, some good things. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe it's okay to stop doing some good things that we're doing. Just look. Just be careful. Roofies. Yeah, whatever. 
Roofies. What did they used to call them in the, before? I mean, that's 100 years old. Roofies. What did they call them before that? Mickeys? They slipped you a Mickey. Yeah, where they put, they put some drug in your drink and make a stupid people stupider. Um, what, what about poor Oprah? She wanted to buy a $38,000 purse, and supposedly one of the guys said, well, you can't afford this. Maybe because he didn't know she was Oprah? Or because he knows what's going on in the United States that was saying, you know what, use your head. You can't afford to blow $38,000. Go help some of the people that you say need to be helped. Where's President Obama? And then Is that what she said? She wouldn't pay $38,000 for a purse? Did she ever get to buy it? Is there any, what's wrong with paying thirty-eight thousand for a purse? What do you think I think about that? Do you think? You can buy a car for thirty-eight thousand dollars. Now look, you can help a lot of people. Jesus said, "The poor you have with you always." You can blow thirty-eight thousand dollars helping people like that, and tomorrow you still don't have a purse. <laughs> do you think I have a problem with paying thirty-eight thousand dollars for a purse? <laughs> yeah? Is, is it too much? Do you think I have a problem paying $3,800 for a, uh, what would I buy, red boots, I don't know. $3,800 for, do I think $3,800 for a purse is too much? $380? What's the line? $380 is too much for a purse? Not for you, baby. I would, I would sell a kidney. To, do I have one? Thir 38 bucks is 38 bucks is that so how do we make our decisions are there some people in the world who would say you would spend what I make in a year $38 for a purse are there some places in the world where they're yeah is it all relative I mean I'm the kind of guy that if you don't give me a wallet for Christmas I'm going to use this same you know thing falling apart in my pocket I can't imagine spending the two bucks I have on a wallet and then I don't have anything to put in the wallet, you know? I think a lot of, a lot of it is relative, yeah? I, I, I have a, ah, spending $38,000 on a purse or a whatever, but look at what we spend on our whatevers, you know? Maybe we wouldn't spend it on a purse. Uh, I think, again, I, I think it, it kind of brings us back to, what best honors the Lord? If you can spend $38,000 on a purse and glorify Jesus, we'll go for it, I guess. Really. If you can have a martini or a, or a beer to take the edge off the day in Jesus' name, not just because you say it's in Jesus' name, but it, it really glorifies God, then knock yourself out, I guess. Right? Um, I don't know that you can. I can't. I couldn't. I couldn't. I saw it on TV. But maybe you can. Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. So whether you go into a swag party or a swag ministry or a, you know, you're drinking a beer or drinking a Coke, there are some people who think that drinking a Coke or a Pepsi is dishonoring to the Lord or drinking coffee or too much coffee or not wearing a suit to preach. Really, Tony, you show up for church like this. So, yes, sinner. So I understand we kind of draw our lines in different places. Whatever you do, do it for the honor and glory of God, right? All right. Over the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, Bible character or maybe lack of Bible character because I'm going to be teaching, and it's easier for me to talk about character that I don't have than character that I do. Um, you know, usually we look at Bible characters and we look at how positive and how godly and how wonderful. I mean, my goodness, they're in the Bible. But these guys were just people, right? I mean, just like preachers are made out of people, people are made out of people, right? And uh, when God uh, throws the light on somebody's life, you see everything. Uh, I don't know if you heard the story here, and this is, unfortunately, this is not unique. Uh, a guy and his, uh, and his wife were in their baby's bedroom, in the, in the nursery, in their baby's bedroom. And they're in the, on the side of the, the bedroom. They're, they're not right there over the baby's crib, but they're in the bedroom. And they have, you know, we have cameras in here, security cameras. Uh, we have the regular monitoring system stuff. And then we have cameras that I set up so that at 2 in the morning I can go on the computer and, you know, uh, if they call me and say, hey, there's a problem at uh, the Southwest Church or at Clearwaves, well, I don't have to 
say, yes, send the police, or I don't have to go in there looking for the Coco Man by myself. I, I can go online, I can look through the cameras, and okay, everything looks fine. No, don't have to send anybody. A uh, husband and a wife were in their baby's bedroom. They heard the camera, and they looked at the camera. Someone was moving the camera, not them, someone was moving the camera, and they heard a voice say, hi, Alicia, which was the baby's name that was printed on the wall. I think it was Alicia or something like that. So somebody, a stranger, had hacked into their wireless camera, could see in the baby's room, could see the baby, could see on the wall, and was talking to the baby because the mom and dad had a wireless camera set up and monitoring system where they could talk to the baby. Hi, Alicia. Daddy loves you. Well, the stranger hacked into the system and did that. Um, uh, we have cameras here. We have cameras at Clear Waves. Uh, I don't have cameras at the house. Well, as paranoid as I am, you'd think I'd have cameras at the house. But as paranoid as I am, I know that it's easy to hack into cameras. I don't want you to know what color socks I'm wearing. <laughs> now, it hasn't occurred to me yet that somebody could... Now, most of you, you read the papers or you, or you, you watch uh, the news. You know that it's possible to hack into your phone, your smartphone. And when it's on, someone could actually be turning on your mic and listening to you speak. You know, the government is recording your phone conversations and recording your email messages and photographing mail and sending it to the government. But did you know that they're also able to use your camera? You take your camera with you everywhere, don't you? I mean, maybe they already know what color socks I wear. <laughs> so you turn it off. They can turn it on. Nothing is secret. Nothing is secret. Well, it's a good thing I didn't send it. It's in your camera. It's in your phone. A la modi. Yeah, but I was young. Oh, well, it's out there. Yeah. God throws light on our lives, and it's way scarier than just having somebody hack your wireless security cameras at home. Because God not only knows, he might tattle. He might tell. Is he taking my picture right now? That's good. 20 bucks I charge when you take my picture. <laughs> Signature 25. God throws the light on people's lives, and he doesn't just know. Sometimes he tattles. We're going to look at Aaron because he starts with A. Next week we're doing B. Lauren already called dibs on, on uh, Eli and Gehazi, so she's got E and G. So uh, if you're lucky, she'll jump in there, but I'm planning A, B, C, D. We're not going to do this for all 75 letters of the alphabet. But, uh, <laughs> but we'll be on it for a little while, and I started with Aaron, okay? Bible character or lack of Bible character. Everybody have a Bible study guide who wants one? Anybody need one? All right, here we go on your mark, get set. First, Aaron's fame, Exodus 4.14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and said, Well, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. Aaron. Aaron is whose brother? Moses' brother. Who's Mo? Mo's the guy that God used to deliver the children of Israel, bring the, Egypt, the Israeli slaves out of Egypt, right? God said, Moses, go to the king of Egypt and say, Let my people go. And Moses said, I can't. I have a hard time sp 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 speaking. The Bible says he had a speech impediment. The Bible says he was slow of tongue. And God said, look, your brother Aaron is on the way. Just let Aaron be your spokesperson. He speaks well. Now, it's kind of cool when people say, wow, you know, I really appreciate uh, hearing you, Tony, because when you talk, you put the cookies on the bottom shelf. I understand what you said. No one's ever said that, but for pretends. But can you imagine someone who's a professional speaker say, hey, listen, I was just messing around and I tripped across your church service online. I just wanted to tell you, wow, I'm really impressed at the way you communicate with people. No one's ever done that either. <laughs> Could you imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, Tom, wow. Oh, I wish when I was walking the earth, I could speak like you. Okay, well, God didn't exactly say that about Aaron, but he said, Aaron, wow, that guy can talk, man. A compliment, not just, man, he can talk, not that. He's a good speaker. Moses, use your brother Aaron. And God was mad at Moses. Aaron can talk well. Let him talk. Aaron's name, eh, depending on who you're reading, right? Depending on what baby's name book you're reading, but it means enlightened or bright. It means mountain of strength, huh? 
Uh, that was his fame. Uh, even God knew who he was. His fortune. He was a lucky dude. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 in this passage, Exodus 7, 7, when they spoke to Pharaoh. Uh, so who's older, Moses or Aaron? Moses is 80, Aaron's 83. So three years older. Aaron's the older brother by three years. Why was Moses in Pharaoh's courts? Do you remember? Why didn't Moses grow up in, with his Hebrew mom? What's that? Pharaoh's daughter raised him. Yeah. Why, though? Why was he in a basket? The mother put him there. How come? Alamodi, go all the way to the beginning. Don't make me go. <laughs> Pharaoh said, every newborn boy, baby, is to be killed. Well, how come Aaron was still alive? <laughs> no, they didn't put him in a basket. More than, what's that? More than likely he was born before. Yeah. That's, you just stifled your woman over there. Oh, yeah, evidently. <laughs> I could have read ahead. Huh? Evidently he was born before Pharaoh's edict to kill the male uh, Hebrew infants. What about his family? Exodus 6, 23, Aaron was married. He had at least four sons. The Bible says that Aaron married Elisheba. Uh, daughter of Aminadab. I like that, Aminadab. If I ever have any more kids, next one's going to be Aminadab, babe. And sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar. Anybody remember the names Nadab and Abihu? They were priests. Actually, all of uh, Aaron's sons were priests. Uh, Nadab and Abihu were killed. Yeah. They were, <laughs> it's, you don't have to be stifled. You can talk all you want. They were serving before the Lord, right? They were in church. They were in the temple. They were serving. And God chamuska them because they did a good thing in a bad way. They dishonored the Lord in their service to the Lord. They, they made God mad in their ministry. And God <laughs> set fire down, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, I read the Bible once or twice. I think that's what happened. Aaron was married, had at least the four kids, huh? So we looked at his fame, his fortune, his family, his faith, Exodus 4.14. Aaron and Moses, the Bible says, were Hebrews of the Hebrews. Evidently, both mother and father were not only Hebrew, Jewish, but they spoke Hebrew. Um, and both of their parents were Levites, the Bible says. Are you raising your hand or stretching? Okay, just check it. Aaron's function. Hang with me, Numbers 18. What was his job? The Lord said to Aaron, you and your sons and your family are to bear the responsibility for offenses connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons alone are to bear the responsibility for offenses connected with the priesthood. Bring your fellow Levites from your ancestral tribe to join you and assist you when you and your sons minister before the tent of the covenant uh, of, the law, of the covenant law. They are to be responsible to you and are to perform all the duties of the tent, but they must not go near the furnishings of the sanctuary or the altar. What tent? What are we talking about? Tabernacle. It, it, that's right. So the, so the Israelis had been in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. God used Moses to deliver them from bondage. They were in the wilderness 10 days, 11 days. Is it going to take a couple of weeks to get to Canaan? How long did they wander? 40 years. They sent in spies to find out if it was exactly the way God said it was. And they came back and said, no, God was mistaken. The spies were in there 40 days checking out Canaan. They came back with a bad report. Ten of them did. Two of them said, look, it's just what, what they, these guys said, what they said. It's scary in there. But God said we could do it. Let's go in. And they took a vote. Mm. And the 10 guys who said, ooh, it's bad, persuaded all the others, all 2 million or 6 million, to not go in. And God said, fine, you don't want to go in? For every day that the spies, who were in there checking everything out, for, for every day that they were in there and decided, that, ooh, we can't believe God, we got to believe what we think, I'm going to let you wander around for a year. They were in there 40 days, you're going to wander in the desert 40 years until everyone 20 years and older is dead dead. Whoa. While they were in the wilderness, God wanted them to worship him. So he gave Moses instructions to build a tabernacle, which literally means tent. The tent in the wilderness is where Aaron uh, offered his sacrifices. I'm afraid to tell you this, but some of you know that I ordered a tent a few yeah. months ago. Yeah. We heard. Yeah. 
Anybody know how big it is? Bigger than this. 50, 52 by 102. 20 feet tall. You plug it into the wall. Just like a raft, except they shipped it from Hong Kong about uh, almost a week ago, and it's in Memphis right now. It's coming here. Oh, I don't know what that was, but sorry. It's happening. Oh, my goodness. I know. It's happening. Yikes. Yikes. As we speak. As we speak. I'm excited. Look. Look at my knees. What are we going to do with that thing? I don't, I don't know. Huh? Let's fill it up with people. I'm praying that God will let us fill this place up with people and then fill these people up with him. I don't know. We, we're not door knockers. We're not, hi, I'm Tony Chavez from the Southwest Church. Can I talk to you about Jesus? I'd rather them come here. Yeah. And people do. My goodness, you invite people, you bring people, and the more comfortable they feel, the more time we get, the more chances we get to talk to them about the Lord. Huh? Uh, and, and that'll give us uh, more time. As I'm praying that God will let us do some other things. But... Anyway, just thought I'd tell you that. They have a tent. I'm going to have a tent. But all the people, Aaron, from the Levite tribe, tribe that I'm, I'm giving to you as helpers, they're not supposed to go near the sanctuary. They're not supposed to go near the altar. Otherwise, both they and you will die. So if they mess up, Aaron, I'm killing you too. Wow. They're, they don't just get fired. They get fire. Yeah. They're to join you and be responsible to take care of the tent of meeting and all the work at the tent. And no one else may come near where you are. You are to be responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the altar so that my wrath will not fall on the Israelites again. I myself have selected your fellow Levites from among the Israelites as a gift to you dedicated to the Lord to do the work of the tent of meeting. But only you and your sons may serve as priests in connection with everything at the altar and inside the curtain. I am giving you the service of the priesthood as a gift. Anyone else who comes near the sanctuary will die. Ooh. All right. So that was Aaron's fame, his fortune, his family, his faith, his function. So that kind of gives us an idea of who he is. All right, let's look at his strengths. All right. Aaron was a good helper for Moses. He was a great helper. The Bible says he was Moses' assistant. He was his minister. Aaron was the minister to Moses, right? He was a great assistant. He was a great helper. Um, first mention of him, uh, uh, Aaron, occurs at uh, uh, Exodus 4.14. Moses is resisting uh, God's directive to, to go talk to the king of Egypt, go talk to Pharaoh. He didn't want to go, so God offered to send Aaron to help him because Aaron could speak well. Huh? Aaron was already on his way to meet Moses, evidently. Um, possibly to tell Moses, Pharaoh has died, and it's okay to go back to Egypt. I mean, we don't know why, but the Bible says that Aaron was already on his way to meet Moses when God told Moses, look, go ahead and ask your brother Aaron to help you. All right? Uh, Moses and Aaron, uh, evidently, they were a great team. They worked well together. Um, they, they stood together. They stood shoulder to shoulder in all of this ministry. Moses, the Bible says, was like a god to Pharaoh speaking with authority. Uh, Aaron was like a prophet addressing the people with words that he was told to speak. Um, is a preacher, me, is a preacher a priest? No? Yeah? Yeah? Is a, is a, kind of, uh, is a preacher, me, a prophet? Hmm? Could be? Um... Yeah, so I mean, I give you maybe little preacher. I, I don't know about the prophet priest thing. A priest, anybody grew up Catholic? Did the priest spend a lot of time looking at y'all and talking to you? And there was a, a reading from the Holy Gospel, you know, and there was a little thing, and they'd say the little thing. But most of it was with the back to us because the priest is doing their thing before the Lord for you. The Catholic Mass, the Catholic church service, the Catholic Mass, by the way, we don't have Mass. The Catholic Mass is built on the Old Testament structure of the priesthood. The priest talked to God for the people. A prophet talked to the people for God. 
God would speak to the prophet, and the prophet would tell the people, just like that. God would speak to the prophet, the prophet would speak to the people. The people would sin, and the priest would talk to God. God, don't kill them. God, don't kill them. A priest speaks to God for the people. Sorry. And it's someone who knows I have church right now. Um, a priest speaks to God for the people, intercedes. God bless them. God protect them. God look out for them. God bring them rain. God comfort them. God help them see. God, a priest speaks to God for the people. A prophet speaks to the people for God. Get right. Quit sinning. Quit living for yourself. Make sure that your life counts for something. God is coming. Is a preacher a priest? Eh, not really. Is a preacher a prophet? Eh, not really. But we function as a priest. We function as a prophet when we do. Um, you know, we don't have deacons. We don't have the office of deacon in this church. We don't have any official deacons. But every time you pick up a piece of paper or help in the cooking area or come and pull a weed or take care of a baby or teach a class or clean the bathroom or, or straighten the hymnals. Do we have hymnals? No. Every time you do something, every time you serve here, you are functioning as a deacon, a servant. Every time you come and do something so that I can be freed up to pray for you and prepare for you so that I can function as a priest, even though I'm not a priest, so that I can function as a prophet, even though I'm not a prophet, every time you do something here that takes some of the load off of the pastor so that the pastor can get under the load that God has given to serve you, you're functioning as a deacon. Deacon means servant. You're part of the diaconate, part of the diakonos. You're a deacon. You serve. We don't have the office of deacon, but we've got lots of them. Every time you do something, good job. And the more you do, the less I do. Now, that sounds kind of awful for me to say that. But from Acts chapter 6 and 7 and 8 in there, you get, you get the idea of the deacons. And deacons, men and women, deacons did things in the ministry, stocking the water and, shoot, buying water, bringing Cokes, picking up Cokes, picking up papers, cutting weeds. That wall needs to be painted. I made that up. Somebody needs to check the air conditioners. I wonder if anybody ever turned the gas off the pilot light on the heaters. I don't know, whatever. Every time you come and you do something, you're serving as a deacon. God is honored and the ministry is strengthened because there are more workers under the weight of ministry. Does that make sense? If you know how to do something, figure out a way to use that here. Really. If you're a rocket scientist, there's got to be a place for you to use that here. If, 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 you, can, if you can do that with a tool... Or, or that with a tool, or oh, with a tool, or whatever you can do, figure out a place to use that here. And you'll find this church being strengthened because you'll be under the weight of the work. Instead of one or two, it'll be y'all. Does that make sense? Moses and Aaron were a great team together. They, they, they stood together. Standing shoulder to shoulder against Pharaoh, huh? Uh, God sent the plagues. Aaron was right there standing by Moses, encouraging him. Uh, giving the Passover instructions. Uh, take the lamb, a certain kind of lamb. Uh, when you kill the lamb, do this with the blood. Uh, after the exodus, Aaron's next job was to call the people together and help Moses explain uh, how they were going to eat. If Taco Bell wasn't built yet, there was no KFC in the wilderness, what are we going to do? I mean, you, you got you to gotta route, you know, from McDonald's to McDonald's, Moses? How are you going to do this? And God told Moses, I, I'm going to provide manna uh, and, and the different times uh, water from the rock and, and I'll turn bitter water into sweet water and I'll provide quail. God was mad at them when they begged for meat, but 
Aaron was standing shoulder to shoulder with Moses in this ministry. So he was a good helper uh, for Moses during the times of ministry. Aaron was a good holder upper. He was a good holder for Moses during times of misery. Now, is there such a thing in the ministry? Don't we go into the ministry because it's all happy, happy, all fun and games, right? There's never a problem, never anything bad, never any pressure, never any sadness, never heartbreak in the ministry. Right off the bat, they come out into Canaan and they're faced with the Amalekites, uh, the enemies, right, of Israel. And God told Moses, take your stick and just hold it up in the air. And as long as you hold that staff up, your people will see that staff and I will be with them and they will be victorious. And Aaron's arms got heavy and the staff goes down, and there was nothing superstitious or magic about it. I don't understand it. This is just the way God set it up for that battle. It didn't work for every battle, only that battle. He's holding up the staff, and the Israelis were winning, and his arm was getting tired, and the staff was coming down, and the Amalekites were winning. And so Aaron and her, her on one side, and Aaron on the other, her not like a girl, but her, H-U-R, like Ben-Hur, her. They stood on either side of Moses, and they held up each end of the staff. Now, don't you imagine Moses still got tired and was wanting to turn loose? I can imagine Aaron on one side, not just holding the staff, but holding Moses' hands. What do I think? Aaron on one side and her on the other, holding the preacher's hand, holding Moses' hand, literally, holding it to the staff and holding it up in the air. And as long as the staff was in the air, the Israels were victorious. He was a good holder for Moses during the times of misery, during the times of struggle, during the times when, look, I still love God and I still want to serve the Lord. I just feel kind of beat up. You've never been there, but you know some people do. Yeah. You just feel kind of beat up and you feel like, you know, I still love you, Lord, and, and, I, and I really do still want to serve you, but I don't know that I can do it the way I've been doing it. You think God understands? You think God throws a hissy like I would? <laughs> God knows. And if we're doing this right, you hang out long enough that you find people who kind of like you, and they are kind of like you, and they kind of get you. They kind of understand when you're having a tough time. And maybe they need to hang on to your hand as they're holding up that staff for you. Aaron was good like that. He held up Moses' hands until sunset. Joshua was able to overcome the Amalekites. They were victorious. Aaron was one of the four people, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, who spoke on God's behalf the first time that the spies went in. He said, no, 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 we need to listen. We need to listen to God. It doesn't matter what you see. We need to go in. We need to go in. Well, Aaron was one who stood with Moses. He and Moses fell face down in front of all the Israelites. When the Israelites said, no, we're not going to go in, Moses and Aaron said, oh, no, God, please please God, and they fell down on their faces before the Lord in prayer, maybe to symbolize their complete trust in God, maybe in recognition of the wrath of God that they knew was about to come. They were broken. They fell before the Lord. When God proclaimed judgment on that first generation, saying they'd wander in the wilderness for 40 years, they fell before the Lord. Oh, God, please, please, God. Oh, God, please don't. But he did. The next rebellion uh, involved a Levite named Korah, a dude named Korah, uh, he and 250 others were, were pretty angry with Moses, but th they, were, they were not happy with Aaron as well because they kind of felt like, who is Moses? Who, who, who died and made Moses the boss? Yeah? Why is Moses the one telling us where to go and what to do and what we're supposed to do, what we're not supposed to do? Who's Moses anyway? Korah led the rebellion, right? And God was happy. God was mad. God didn't like that at all. Um... So uh, they, they were mad at Aaron, too. He's standing next to Moses. Well, Korah seemed to think that he should be the high priest. So Moses said, well, look, well, why don't we do this? You guys all bring censers. Remember, a censer is uh, it, it, it was a plate, a bowl, that held the burning coals from the altar. All right, kind of like if you grew up Catholic, remember what the altar boy would hold under your chin so that you wouldn't drop Jesus during communion? You know, it was to catch the, yeah. That, so it's a little plate with a handle on it. Moses said, why don't all you boys go get a censer uh, to, to, you know, that's used to serve God in the, in the tabernacle, and, and you bring it back. Now, only priests were supposed to have those censers. They said, we can, 
Korah said, I can be you, Moses. You're nobody. And the 250 of us, we can, we're just like the Levites. We, 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 can, we can do this, right? So Moses said, well, go ahead and bring priestly tools. Bring your censers, and we'll be there waiting. And Korah and uh, two of his followers, uh, two followers, I think there's more than two. I don't know why it says Korah and two followers, but they were swallowed up by the earth, but Aaron and Moses was vindicated. The grumbling increased the next day. The plague began. This time it was Aaron who offered the incense uh, as an atonement for the people, and the plague stopped. To settle the matter once for all, Aaron and the leaders, this is pretty cool, Aaron and the other leaders put their sticks, their walking sticks, you know, a walking stick, they, they put it in the tent of meeting overnight, and the next morning, Aaron's rod had budded. It had little flowers on it, and almonds were already boop, 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 popping out of that dead stick. I mean, God vindicated Aaron. So he was a great uh, helper for Moses during the ministry. He was a great holder for Moses during misery. Okay, those are his strengths. You ready for the shortcomings? Problems. Aaron was a good leader if he had a good leader. Let that sink in a little bit. Aaron was a good leader as long as he had a good leader. So what does that mean? He was a good leader, but he needed to be what? Huh? He followed instructions well. Yeah. As long as he had a good superior, as long as he was following the leader, it was good to follow Aaron. But if he had a bad leader or no leader, he's not the best dude to follow. Let's see if that, he fell for a bunch of silly stuff. Let, let's see if that's, uh, if that's borne out here. Aaron was a good leader if he had a good leader. He was easily persuaded to move from God's way when he was under pressure. Now, you know, we, we used to talk a lot about the God path. Uh, there, there's, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. There's a way that God wants you to walk on. You know, this is the way, walk ye in it. There's a path that's right. And the path is generally not the same as the one that leads you toward the world. The foam party is generally not on this path that leads you closer to Jesus. It may be not sinful, but if it's not smart, if it's not spiritual, use your head. Yeah. Well, he was easily persuaded to move from God's way when he was under pressure. I don't know the, the, why that would make a difference. <clears throat> Moses, Aaron, and his two sons and 70 elders were invited up the mountain to worship God. They were allowed to see God without harm to themselves. Moses and Joshua went up farther. Now, this is when, this is when, when Moses uh, came before the burning bush and God spoke and said, Take off thine sandals. That's the way God talks. Um, the Ten Commandments, anyway. For the place where thine standest is holy ground. And Mo went, Dude, and he took off his sandals and looked at the burning bush. It wasn't a big deal to see. A, he'd seen tumbleweeds on fire before. This one didn't burn up. It just burned and burned and burned. Well, that was not a big deal either, but when the bush started talking to him, that was kind of freaky. Yeah. And God proved that he was indeed I am. He was Jehovah. He was the one. Well, God invited Aaron and Aaron's sons to come up with Moses and Joshua, come up and see God. Now, the Bible says no man can see God and live, but God allowed Moses and Aaron and Aaron's sons and Joshua to go up to see the Lord, to come up a little farther. Um, where am I here? Uh, Joshua went up a little far, farther. Next one. Now Moses went into the cloud then for 40 days, and Joshua's waiting patiently. So these guys go up. They see God, and Joshua goes up with Moses a little farther, and then Joshua waits, and Moses goes up a little farther. At precisely the same time that Moses and God are having this conversation, you know, Ten Commandments and be holy, Aaron is downstairs. He went back down the mountain. And you remember the movie with Charlton Heston, the Ten Commandments? What did they talk Aaron into doing? Making a golden calf. We want a God we can see. We want a God we can serve. Mustero, you liar. You don't want a God you can serve. You want a God that you can control. You want a, you want a Santito you can put on your dashboard. You don't want a God who tells you what to do. You want a God that you can control. Aaron, make us one. Uh, um, uh, mm, mm. He was a good leader as long as he was following a good leader, but the good leader was up on the mountain, and he was under pressure. Do it, do it, do it. Easily persuaded. So there was a little devil on one side, and if the leader wasn't there, there was another devil on the other side. Yeah, he just, do it. Come on, do it. Aaron, do it. Do Aaron, do it. 
So what happens, right? Uh, where are we? Moses went into the cloud. There we go. Then when Aaron uh, fashioned the golden calf, so he took their jewelry, right? Threw it into the fire, came out. He hammered that stuff together and he made idols. And he not only made the idols, he said, Oh, Israel, here are your gods. And then he built an altar so that they could sacrifice to these false gods. And then the Bible says the party got started. It doesn't say it exactly like that, but that was basically... Huh? The foam party began. Uh, they, they did all kinds of things that probably shouldn't be done in church. I'm not sure, but probably not. They were full of themselves. They were very sensual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they were doing everything they wanted to do. Now, what happens when we do everything? Now, we're spiritual, but most, most people, when they do everything they want to do, it doesn't turn out that good. All right, so Aaron, Aaron did all of this for these people, right? Moses comes down the mountain. He sees what's going on. He throws a fit. Come on, Moses. Dude, we're just partying a little bit here. You know, we're praying. We're praying, and we're partying, and we're praying. Come on, Moses. Everything's got to be your way. Well, Moses took the Ten Commandments, and he threw them down. He broke them, right? He took the golden calf, melted it down, uh, basically turned it to dust. Asked Aaron, dude, what were you thinking? And Aaron said, well, the people made me do it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. You know what happened? I took all their jewelry and I threw it in the fire. A la modi, this calf just jumped out. It's a miracle. So then later the people, I mean, that was pathetic, right? So the people again are grumbling about not having, not having water. God told Moses to speak to a rock and the water would gush out. And it did all that, but Moses keeps talking, or maybe Aaron was speaking for him. And in the process... Aaron dishonored God because Moses was in the process of dishonoring God. So when Moses, the good leader, wasn't there, Aaron... When Moses, the good leader, wasn't being a good leader, Aaron went... Yeah? He was a good leader as long as he was following a good leader. Now, I don't know if this speaks to you at all, but it's important that we're following the right people. If you have an ungodly boss, if, if you're hanging out with someone who doesn't love the Lord, even if they say they do, if they're not following this, they're not. So what are you going to do? But I love him. But I love her. But, you know, this is what we do. This is, this is how I make my living. You know, you got to decide. I got to decide. But when you make your decisions, are you flying by the seat of your pants? Are you, are you living the way of, of the, you know, sensual way? Are you doing what you want? Are you doing what he wants? I mean, it's easy for me to talk like that. It's a little harder to live like that. Aaron was bad when he didn't have a good leader. He was just so easily persuaded. So he dishonored God in all of that. Their punishment, that they would die in the wilderness. They wouldn't enter the promised land. So we, we always remember, I think, that Moses didn't get to go in. Neither did Aaron. Aaron didn't get to go into the promised land. Moses, Aaron, and his son Eliezer went up to the top of Mount Or, and there Moses transferred Aaron's garments to his son. Son, you're the new high priest. And he never came down from the mountain. He died up there. So uh, he was weak. He uh, was easily persuaded to move from God's way when he was under pressure. He was easily persuaded to murmur. What does it mean to murmur? To gripe? Complain. He was easily persuaded to murmur against God workers, God's workers, when he was under pressure. That's not a big deal. People gripe about me every day. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of preachers, what, what passage do we like to throw out there? Touch not the Lord's anointed. Amen. Well, he was easily persuaded to gripe and gossip and murmur against God's workers when under pressure. The grumbling against Moses and God began almost immediately. Huh? They leave Mount Sinai. They're without water and food. Uh, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? And what are we going to do? And how are you going to find enough food for 2 million or 6 million people? God instructed Moses to gather 70 elders together. Some of Moses' spirit was given to them. I don't, I don't know what that means, but that's what the Bible says. This was... To, what's that? Uh, actually, it was more of... When the Holy Spirit comes on us today, comes in us. He, he lives in us and He doesn't leave us. In the Old Testament, remember David prayed a prayer, O oh Lord, oh Lord, take not thine Holy Spirit from me. 
it, I, I don't understand it, but it kind of looks like today in the New Testament, God inhabits his people. In the Old Testament, God made a temple for his people. Today, God makes his people a temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into you and stays in you. That's the down payment, the guarantee, the earnest that you're getting into heaven. That's the down payment. That's the promise you're getting into heaven. Not that you're good or that you're not bad, but that the Holy Spirit is in you. In the Old Testament, I don't understand it, but it kind of looks like the Holy Spirit did more drive-by yeah. stuff. You know, the Holy Spirit was on Saul, and the Holy Spirit wasn't on Saul. The Holy Spirit was on Saul, and then he'd get all depressed. The Holy Spirit would leave, and David would come and play the, you know, he'd bring his mariachi band, his buddies over, and David would play the guitar, and, you know, Saul would kind of, oh, and the Spirit would come on him again. It kind of looks like something of the Holy Spirit was, yes, a Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And, and these are good things, good qualities. Yeah. Not lukewarm, but really strong, really passionate. Yeah. Now, I totally agree. And, 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 and I think that's exactly what happened. Now, whether it was just because enthusiasm, which literally means, uh, you know, the Greek word theos. Theos is, is the Greek word for God. An is the same as our I-N. An is in. In theos. Enthusiasm literally means God in a person. And that's the, that's the denotation. The connotation is, whoa, you know, enthusiasm. But literally it means God in a person, enthusiastic. So wh whether it's just enthusiasm or, or the Holy Spirit on them, there was a passion there. Now just a little a parenthesis here uh, re re regarding the uh, against God's workers. Uh, what happens when a preacher, not me, not I, what happens when a preacher gets, uh, is it possible to get too passionate about something, too about something. Shouldn't a, shouldn't a, shouldn't a pastor be kind of, not lukewarm, but um, uh, I don't even have a word for it. it depends, on if it's the flesh or the depends on whether it's the flesh or the spirit. Well, shoot, that was like strike two for me. That was one and two in the same... So it's okay to be passionate? When, when, when does that cross the line? Well, the flesh... Why did that make me feel uncomfortable when you sound like a little god? I don't know. Yeah. 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 And kind of invoking God like. God said, God wants, but really it's I want, I said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, preachers, pastors need to be careful. I need to be careful. We need to be careful when we're praying for each other, when we're listening to guys on TV or listening to, you know, recorded messages. You got to be careful. You want to be discerning. You want to you exercise discretion. Everything a preacher says isn't necessarily from the Lord, right? Um, we, I, I hope you give people the... You do me. You give me the benefit of the doubt when I say something stupid, if I ever would. When, when we get uh, enthusiastic, whether in the spirit or maybe just enthusiastic, I want us to learn to be discerning, which is why I get so concerned when I hear people say, well, the Holy Spirit told me that, or God led me to do that, or I just know God wants me. Ah. It's hard to grow up when we stay in that fantasy world. God wants us to do what because he says certain things, not because you think certain things. You believe God wants you. Okay, fine, believe it. But don't say that God told you to unless it says right there, Tony, I want you to go wash your truck. Or okay, I believe God wants me to wash my truck. Well, believe it all you want. Maybe it's just dirty. It's okay to have common sense. 
I believe God wants me to not have another beer or a first one. You know, I think the Holy Spirit wants me to go ahead and go with that brother and have a drink with him. Really? <laughs> Just say you want to go have a beer. No, I really think the Lord wants me to encourage him and, you know, he's not going to come into my world. I need to go into his. No. You bring them into your world if you're living close to Jesus. If they're not living close to Jesus, stay out of their world. It's the world. It's the world. But sometimes we get a little passionate, a little enthusiastic about trying to protect, trying to persuade. A pastor's job is really pretty easy. I don't even know what pastors are supposed to do. My job is to teach, it's to proclaim, right? My job is to protect. I really think a lot of what we're supposed to do is position you so that when God nudges you in His direction, you're ready to go. I preach to you, I protect you, I position you so that when God moves you, you're ready to go. I preach to you, I protect you, I position you. Of course, I pray for you. That's all of this. So that when God moves you, you're ready to go. When you pull into an intersection to make a U-turn or make a left-hand turn, what have I said before? Good preachers tell you how to drive, right? You get into the intersection, be careful about keeping your wheels turned a certain way because if you get rear-ended, your car is going to follow the way the wheels are turned, aren't they? Make sure that your wheels are turned so that when you get rear-ended by the Holy Spirit, you go in the direction that He wants you to go in. If He wants you to go into traffic, fine. I think not. But do what you can to know where God wants you to go so that when either you get rear-ended by life or the Spirit of God starts driving you, man, you're on course. I think it's my job to preach to you. I think it's my job to protect you. I think it's my job through God's Word to position you so that when the Spirit of God moves you, and He's going to do it through this. He's not going to do it through something that pops into your head. Then you move in His direction. Then you follow God. Well, a lot of these guys, they, they, they did what seemed right to them. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. Be careful. God instructed uh, Moses to get these guys together. God gave them a, a portion of, of uh, his spirit. But then Aaron and Miriam got all bent out of shape. Who made you boss, Moses? Now, Aaron should have known better. He stood with Moses when Korah said, Who made you boss, Moses? He was on the mountain when God made Moses boss. But now he's saying, Moses, who made you boss? Well, evidently, well, we don't know this for sure, but uh, Aaron and Miriam's complaint against Moses was, first of all, you married a black woman. That's what it says in the Bible. That Aaron said to Moses, Dude, why did you marry an Ethiopian? Why did you marry a Cushite? Why did you marry a burnt woman? It's literally what that means, a black woman. Why did you marry her? And she was already married. He was already married, right? Maybe Zipporah had died. Maybe he took on another wife. But whatever it was, Aaron was all bent out of shape. Why did you marry a, a, a Cushite? And then, really, the Lord only speaks through you, Moses. Really? Who are you? Come on. Now, the first is attack on his wife. The second, a display of maybe sibling rivalry. Or they're jealous as though Moses were God's favorite. Huh? Uh, Miriam's name is listed first. It's not Aaron and Miriam, but Miriam and Aaron. Maybe she was the prime complainer. That would kind of fit into the pattern that we see in Aaron's life. He was kind of a follower. Yeah. He led as he was following somebody else. People followed him. He was, he was a talker, man. He could speak. He could persuade people. But if he wasn't following the right goal, if he wasn't following the right God, if he wasn't following the right guy, he's going to lead you astray. Miriam's name is listed first. Maybe she, she was the one who kind of stirred this stuff up. Uh, and anyway, Aaron finally tried to defuse the situation. Miriam is the one who ended up getting leprosy. Remember, God, God smote her, the Bible says. Aaron would appear to get away with it, but he pleads uh, with Moses on Miriam's behalf. Maybe afraid the same thing would happen to him. Okay, here we go, real quick. I didn't realize time was so far. You got me caught up talking about enthusiasm and stuff. But I'm blaming you. Two principles. Be happy, bro. Look, God knows all about your fame. He knows about your fortune. He knows about your family. He knows about your faith. He knows about your function. He knows where you were born. He knows about your mom. He knows about your dad. He knows if it was good. He knows if it was bad. He knows if you grew up around the worst, most horrible examples. He knew if you had the most godly family. He knew everything about it. Embrace it employ it. God knows who you are. 
Use it for Him. Use it for His glory. Have a blast. Enjoy your life. Be filled with joy. Not because of the party. Because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because God is doing something. God knows about your life. So embrace it. Employ it. Enjoy it. Be happy, bro. Look, your ministry for the Lord might be best carried out in the shadow of another's ministry. That's okay. That's all right. Let somebody else lead. Let them run interference. Let them take the first hit on the field. That's okay. If your ministry is best carried out in the shadow of another's ministry, great. Now, I'm not just talking about a preacher. I'm talking about anybody. It might be somebody in your family. Maybe you minister best before the Lord standing side by side with somebody else. Maybe your ministry doesn't have to be your ministry. Maybe your ministry is to stand shoulder to shoulder with somebody else. That's okay. Your ministry for the Lord might be best carried out in the shadow of another's ministry. So be the best helper you can be, okay? You focus on the goal, not your personal glory. What is God wanting to accomplish here? What, what, what does God really want to happen in that person's life? How can I help? God, what, what do you want to happen? It's not about how I look. It's not about how I'm doing. It's about what's happening. Yeah, it's the goal, right? Um, your ministry for the Lord might be best carried out in the shadow of another's ministry. Your ministry for the Lord might be best carried out in the struggle of misery. Now, if you listen to Brother Joel, if God's favor is chasing you down, there is no misery. If you listen to Joycey, if you have the faith, there is no misery. Joyce and Joel are both wrong. They're great encouragers, but they're not giving you the whole gospel. As much as they pride themselves on being Pentecostal, charismatic, giving the whole gospel of God, they're wrong. Because the favor of God looks hard. Your best life is not now. It's in heaven. In this world, you will have tribulation. So be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, Jesus said. The Bible says those who would be righteous in this life will be persecuted. Well, if you're not being persecuted, maybe you're just following the world. Maybe it just hasn't hit you yet. Your ministry for the Lord might be best carried out when you're having the hardest time, when you're feeling the worst, when you're overwhelmed, when it seems like, God, this is just not fair. Why are you making me decide? God, this isn't right. Why are you making me go down this path? God, why do you make me go through this? Why can't you just fix this? Why can't you make them see what I see? Yeah? Maybe your ministry for the Lord is best carried out when you're down, when you're struggling, when you're in misery. Well, if that's the case, just be the best encourager you can be. Now, I know that sounds easy, but encourage other people. But you can't do that if your focus is on you. If your focus is on what a rough time you're having, how are you going to minister before the Lord? How are you going to encourage people? How are you going to hold up Moses? How are you going to be the Aaron or the her if all you can think about is my arms are tired too? <laughs> yeah, but what about me? There's an awful ministry holding up sticks. It's bigger than holding up sticks. It's bigger than standing next to another minister, another preacher, another people. <laughs> it's bigger than that. Your ministry for the Lord maybe is best carried out when you're not feeling so hot. So don't cover your ministry up under the blanket and just sleep another hour. Don't waste another minute of your life. Get up, get out. Man, we sleep our lives away behind steering wheels. We sleep at, at work. We sleep our lives away in the pulpit. We tread water is what I mean. You know, we're, we're active. We're just not accomplishing anything for God. So evaluate. Focus on the destination, not your personal difficulty. Where are you going? Are you getting closer to God? Or are you just, you know, running out the clock? I'll be dead here soon. Don't run out the clock. Man, go, go for another one. Go for another touchdown. Go for another win. Try it again. Go again. They'll hit you. Go again. Be the best encourager you can be. Your destination is really more important than your personal difficulty. So be happy, bro, and be careful, bro. When you feel the pressure to walk from God's way, when people are pressuring you, when situations are pressuring you, when you feel like it's best to walk away from anything good, when you feel like it's best to stay away from anything godly, when you feel like this is really better for right now, I'm not going to minister right now, I'm not going to serve right now, I'm not going to be right now. When you feel the pressure to walk from God's way, recognize the real reason and follow the Lord anyway. The reasons that we give for not serving God, Satan can't stop you. Have you ever heard me say that? 
Satan can't stop you. Satan cannot stop you. But he throws up enough doubt, enough discouragement. You get disillusioned. And who decides to stop? You do. You do. When you feel the pressure to walk from God's way, recognize the real reason. And then keep following the Lord. When you feel the pressure to whine against God's workers, that would be me. Actually, it's anybody. Anybody who's serving the Lord next to you. You know, some people think that's what I'm doing against Joel and Joyce. It's not whining against them. It's trying to help you grow up. Look beyond the sermons. Look to the scriptures. What is the truth? When you feel the pressure to whine against God's workers, remember their responsibility. Remember what God has placed on your shoulders, my shoulders. Remember their responsibility and follow the leaders. If you don't want to follow me, fine, but find a leader who's following the Lord and follow them. Huh? So, I don't know about you, but I, I like that. That was helpful for me, looking at Aaron's life. The strengths, yeah, the strengths are the strengths. The shortcomings, that's what trips us up. That's what trips us up. Lord Jesus, help us not be tripped up. And then God, when we are, help us get up and just start serving you again. It doesn't take a lot of fanfare. It doesn't take a lot of big hoopla. It doesn't take a big old ceremony. Just help us get up and dust ourselves off and get back in the saddle, back serving you. God, I pray that you would bring us back to where we were at the beginning of our church. God, so many of the people here were involved in ministry, way more than half. And God, we've, we've kind of slipped into that, we've kind of slipped into that place where just a handful of people are doing most of the work. God, take us back to the place where most of us are under the load, not just a few of us. God, help us see the goal. Help us see beyond our personal difficulties. God, help us realize that when life is just beating the snot out of us, uh, life isn't the final, the final arbiter. Life is not the final judge. What's happening in our lives is not all there is to it. God, you want us to look to you. You want us to really lean on you. You want us to live for you. God, help us do that. Help us be the people of God you've called us to be in this church until you move us somewhere else. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us first. Use us, use us, use us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Love you, babe. Miss you. King.